have their little meeting, and then it's time to film the video. Both advertising executives were struck by Megan's insistence that she, the star, be in control. I mean, talk about illusions of grandeur. She was bossing everybody on that set. She was being incredibly difficult to work with. And everyone, it seemed, was there to serve her. And nobody seemed to know how to stand up to her because she was like the celebrity. She was the talent on the video. So everyone kept sort of like giving in to her demands, except for Elizabeth. Elizabeth was like, I don't think so, okay? She would not oblige. And throughout the day, they disagreed over and over about the script so that the final product was not even usable. So they'd spend all day long trying to make this video with Meghan Markle and then it was all for naught. Good morning, how are you? Welcome to another episode of Revenge Review. We're going through Tom Bauer's book as an answer to spare. Now on this channel, the purpose of this channel was to review memoirs. And I started out with Prince Harry's book because that was a memoir that had just come out and everyone was talking about it. But after reading that trash, and we were also desperate for some facts, I veered away from the original intent of the channel because I knew that we all wanted to hear some actual facts and actually find out what happened in the story. So Tom Bauer came to our rescue and he is giving us all the facts. Um, if you will stay to the end of this video, I'm going to talk about the next book that we're going to talk about. Um, and it actually is we're going back to the memoir style of writing. And I think you guys are going to be very excited about what I chose. So rather than vote this time, I'm going to select a book that you are going to be very excited about. And I think that you guys have trusted me thus far to tell you stories. Stay till the end of the video to find out what we're reading next. Um, obviously, we have quite a bit of revenge left to get through. So it won't be for a while, but I just want to go ahead and prep you guys for what we're doing after this. Anyway, back to the book. Um, this chapter does not disappoint. Now, the title of this chapter, as I alluded last episode, is Hillary. But Hillary Clinton doesn't play a huge role. Um, it's really more her friend, John Fitzpatrick, because he and his relationship with Hillary Clinton ends up being the avenue by which Meghan is able to get um, some traction at the UN. But when I say some, I really mean like hardly any. Okay, now, <laughs> This chapter also really highlights Megan's complete and total love affair that she's having with herself and the idea that she has that she is some kind of God's gift to feminism. Now, I don't know where she comes off thinking that she's some big feminist. I'm not sure what causes she's promoted, what lifestyle she's choosing to live, that would suggest that she is some kind of feminist icon, but she truly believes that she is and would that someone give her a platform so she could finally finally bring the message of feminism but from shore to shore in america finally could if only someone would let her speak because she she has the message so um this whole chapter is incredibly illuminating about what a diva she has become it's astounding to me how this person who is an utter nobody thinks that she should be given all these platforms and is disgruntled and annoyed and angry and frustrated when she is not being given platforms that these A-list celebrities are being given. And also these celebrities that are promoting causes and involved in different charities that would highlight their true desire to help the globe and to help their causes. But Megan, she's not involved in anything that would highlight her true heart for the causes that she says that she espouses. So it's just an unbelievable chapter. I I was gobbling it up and, and, and in total like, what, what, what? I mean, question mark, question mark, question mark. What in the world is this behavior? All right, so settle back. We're gonna talk about that. Chapter eight, Hillary. And Hillary really is going to open some doors for Megan, but it isn't, like I said, it's not really Hillary that's opening doors. It's really her friend, John Fitzpatrick. And, you know, Tom Bauer has to sort of dance around some, some of the topics that he discusses because if he doesn't, he's going to get sued. But he says some things in this chapter that illuminate what Megan was up to with Fitzpatrick and it's not great. And in the comments, everyone has been like, what was she really doing with Fitzpatrick? I think I know what she's doing with Fitzpatrick. I think we all know what she was doing with Fitzpatrick, but 
um, hmm. it goes on to be really clear that, and I think it's going to only get more clear as we read. This was not like her and her favorite uncle going out to dinner, you know, this guy and, and her were, there was some, there was favors being exchanged. I think that's the best way to put it. Okay, we begin with John Fitzpatrick saying that he escorted Megan around New York all the time. And he says that she often stayed at his hotel in Manhattan. Fitzpatrick understood Megan's ambition and he understood that she wanted to meet and spend time with celebrities. He was also of the same mind. So he didn't look down on her or think that her rabid need to network was a flaw. I mean, he was like, yeah, me too. So he was all the day long dragging her all around New York and she loved it. He invited her to all the best restaurants. There was one called La Bilbuki, which he pronounced Bill Buckley. <laughs> a man after my own heart in the pronunciation department. And this was like New York's snobbiest restaurant on the Upper East Side. People were begging to get a table in there. There was all these celebrities. Bill Clinton was in there all the time. People just couldn't wait to get in and sit next to their favorite celebrity. And so John Fitzpatrick opened many literal doors for Meghan. Um, but the one that she was the most interested in was his close relationship with the Clintons. Now he had been funding the Clintons low these many years. And in 2015, he had hosted Hillary's fundraising campaign in the city right before she ran for um, presidency the following year. Nobody was better connected than Hillary Clinton. So for Meghan to be friends with John Fitzpatrick, who was connected to Hillary Clinton, it was like the chain of friendships that she couldn't wait to get in on. So she had asked Fitzpatrick if he could use his connection with Hillary Clinton to get her some kind of appointment with the UN Women's Program. So Fitzpatrick said, I can help you out. So a request from Hillary Clinton's office to Pumzili Milambo Nikuka who was the head of the UN Women at the headquarters in New York, secured the vital introduction that Megan sought. And Megan was connected with a woman named Elizabeth Nyamiaro, who was a Zimbabwean employee of the United Nations. And that campaign that um, Nyamiaro was in charge of was looking to promote women's rights and eradicate gender equality by 2030. So this was right up Megan's alley. This is exactly what she wanted to talk about. Now, she doesn't really know much about this topic at all, but she knows how to say bland political statements and throw in the word feminist often enough that, you know, she can make people feel good. She's here for it. So Nyamiaro contacts Megan. They have a telephone conversation and she asks if Megan would like to be a women's advocate for political participation in Africa. And this was exactly what Megan wanted. <laughs> Sign me up. So Nyami Yaro says, Megan should do one week's internship in uh, New York, and then she should front a promotional video advocating female leadership. But here's the thing. Elizabeth Nyami Yaro is no wallflower, okay? She has a distinctive voice. She is very professional. She is very upfront and forthright, and she has her own agenda that she's running here, okay? She's not here just to give handouts to celebrities who want to do something between projects. She's got a very clear political agenda, and you're invited to come, but if you want to step in the way and try to run the show, <laughs> no, there's only one captain of this ship, and it's not you. So this was a relationship destined to be fraught with all kinds of negativity. Okay, so to accommodate Megan's schedule, they said, we can film this video after you've done your one week internship at the UN, then um, this video, this promotional video we want you to film, we'll, we'll film it in Toronto for you to, you know, because you've got a schedule, you've got to keep up there with suits. But Nyami Yaro wanted Matt Hassel, who was supposed to be the creative director um, of this promotional video, to fly down to New York from Toronto so that that he could meet this famous celebrity who would be the video's star. It was all very cloak and dagger about who this celebrity was gonna be. It was all very secretive. And Matt Hassel thought it must be somebody who was incredibly famous, like an ultimate A-lister. Like maybe it was Meryl Streep. Who could it be that they were being so secretive and you know, whispery and excited about and we've got a new girl on? So he comes down to New York to meet Megan. But this is very weird to me because he comes down to meet her, but then not knowing who it was he was going to meet. In the meeting, 
it is finally revealed who the celebrity star of the video is going to be. And who does it, who is it? Meghan Markle. Talk about a disappointment. And Hassel says he sat there dumbfounded. Who? He and his producer, neither of them had heard who, of who Meghan Markle was. And they hadn't ever heard of Meghan or Suits. But they were both like, oh, wonderful. Okay. Wow. All right. But this is what's weird. They came down to meet Megan, but then Megan shows up to the meeting through a Zoom call. So I'm not sure why they had to travel down. Why, why, why could Megan not make that meeting? The book is not clear. But anyway, she joins the conversation by Zoom. They try to pretend like they know who she is and that they're really excited to work with her. Well, but it goes out of control real quick because they have their little meeting and then it's time to film the video. Both advertising executives were struck by Megan's insistence that she, the star, be in control. I mean, talk about illusions of grandeur. She was bossing everybody on that set. She was being incredibly difficult to work with. And everyone, it seemed, was there to serve her. And nobody seemed to know how to stand up to her because she was like the celebrity. She was the talent on the video. So everyone kept sort of like giving in to her demands, except for Elizabeth. Elizabeth was like, I don't think so, okay? She would not oblige. And throughout the day, they disagreed over and over about the script so that the final product was not even usable. So they'd spent all day long trying to make this video with Meghan Markle and then it was all for naught. Nevertheless, in February of 2015, Megan flew with Nyamiyaro 9,000 miles from New York to Rwanda. And the whole point of this was for gender equality. That's the whole thing. Uh, the problem was, is that they were kind of being the frontman and the voice for what appears to be a complete and total tyrant dictator. Now, I'm not gonna even try to pretend like I know all about the Rwandan politics. So I'm going to use Tom Bauer's words here. Rwanda had been the site of an appalling tragedy in the early 1990s, a genocidal civil war between two tribes, the Tutsis and the Hutus, had ended after the brutal death of about 800,000 Tutsi civilians. Paul Kagame, a Tutsi army officer, had emerged in 2000 from the bloodbath to become the country's president, receiving 90% of the popular vote. But by 2015, Kagame was widely accused of being complicit in mass murder. Many of his political opponents had been found dead, not only in Rwanda, but across Africa. And Hutu refugees in neighboring Congo were being slaughtered by the Rwandan army. But against all logic, Britain's former Prime Minister Tony Blair and many in the world community paraded Kagame as a model African Democrat. As a regular reader of The Economist, Megan would have been aware of Kagame's reputation. But if she wanted to ingratiate herself with Nyamiyaro, she had no choice but to support him. Because Nyamiyaro thought that Kagame was responsible for making Rwanda an exemplary model of female leadership to every country. And in her admiration for the dictator, Nyamiyaro described Rwanda's women politicians as phenomenal. But the thing is, is that those women politicians were just sort of rubber stamps of Kagame himself because nobody was going to stand up to Kagame. Um, what, why would they? They'll probably end up dead and in the street somewhere. So this did not stop Megan. She doesn't really care about the politics of the region. She just is there to talk about women and everything being equal. And she doesn't, she doesn't care if she's sort of also being the front for this dictator. She just came out and she praised the president of the country. And she said, we need more men like that. And during a week of meeting female Rwandan politicians, she was excited that 64% of the Rwandan senators were women. But the reason that there are so many women is because of the mass murder of Rwandan men during the tribal genocide. So if not for the women, who else would be running the Senate? Um, and she didn't seem to be bothered at all by the fact that the president of Rwanda is over here traveling across the world in his large private jet, staying at $2,000 per night hotels while his countryman's average daily wage was $2. She wasn't too worried about that wage discrepancy, but she was just here to play the part of the global feminist. And she loved the idea of styling herself as this angel of mercy. She loved the fact that while she got to stay overnight in these luxury hotels, there's a refugee camp, but not but a hop, skip and a jump away, and she can go over there and hang out with the distraught women who are trying to cope with a, the tragedy of living in a refugee camp. 
And she apparently, I mean, she says that she went there and she asked them, how are you coping with your life here? But their responses were, were, were barely listed. She didn't have, she didn't take, seemingly she took no notes. She took no real concern over what their actual answers were, what their actual life experiences were there. She didn't necessarily care. She just needed the photo op of being there. Then she, you know, hustles back to the Capitol and she records on her Instagram account that this trip is the type of work that feeds my soul. It feeds your soul to be around a bunch of people who are in a refugee camp barely making it? That enlivens you? You feel, what did you do for them? What use were you? Did you bring anything? Did you share anything with them? Did you give them anything? Did you help them in any way? No, you just were there to use them so that you could look better. How is that feminism? Okay, so and she's not troubled by the contrast of her life and theirs. And here's the thing. I mean, it's not, I, okay. You don't have to go and live in a refugee camp to have some care and concern for their experience. I'm not saying that, oh, since she didn't decide to go make camp with them, then, you know, she, the journey was all for naught. But all I'm saying is she's just really flippant about their experience. And she writes, my life shifts from refugee camps to red carpets. I choose them both because these worlds can in fact coexist. You get to choose them. The, the woman in the refugee camp, she's got no choice. What a privilege for you to get to say, I choose them both. Oh, do you? I mean, I, I, what is this? She doesn't have any idea what she's saying. That, that, that's the thing with Megan. She doesn't know what she's saying. Because half the words that come out of her mouth, I'm, I'm just like, had, had you thought about that for like two seconds, you probably wouldn't have said that. Okay, things go on to be even more shocking with Megan. Um, on her next trip to London, she meets with G uh, Gina Nelthorpe Crown. Remember, that was a new agent that she had in England. And she described Elizabeth Nyamiyaro as a, quote, real friend. I think Nyamiyaro was real sick of Megan, but... Whatever Megan needs to say to ingratiate herself into this new side of political activism, she will. And according to Megan, through this UN executive, she was certain to secure greater public exposure. She said to her friend Gina that she took it really seriously to be a role model for young women. And she expected any day now to be promoted from a UN advocate to a UN ambassador like Emma Watson. Why? Why should they do that? Why, why should they do that? Megan's jealousy was compounded daily because she desperately wanted to beat Emma Watson at, the at being the face of the UN Women's Council, but it wasn't happening for her. In, sep in September 2014, Watson had launched the UN's He For She campaign at the UN headquarters in New York, and her impassioned speech had gotten a lot of attention. Watson was praised by Mumzili um, and Mumzili said, we're thrilled and honored to work with Emma, whom we believe embodies the values of the UN women. Megan wanted that same stardom. And on her blog, remember, she's got two blogs. One is the TIG, which is openly her. And then she's got this other blog that's like anonymous, but we know it's Megan. And it's called Working Actress. And she wrote, as she imagined her star rising higher and higher, she writes, I work long hours. I travel for press. My mind memorizes, my mind spins, my days blur, my nights are restless, my hair is primped, my face is painted, my name is recognized, my star meter is rising, my life is changing. I don't have the energy to describe how stupid that is. Is this a life you want? Like none of that sounds good. I work long hours, I travel, my mind is spinning, my days are blurred, my nights are restless, but my star is rising. Great, good, but why would you want it? Like the the trade off here, your life is a wreck, but your star like people know me, my my name's being recognized. Yeah, well, you sell your soul to the devil. This sounds terrible. Um, her agent Gina Nelthorpe Crown was also noticing the change, so now she felt that she needed to kind of hmm, make sure that Megan was given better accommodations and things because Megan was going to put up a fuss if she wasn't given the star treatment because her star is rising. And so her agency arranged for Megan to stay for free at the five-star Dorchester Park Lane. 
Okay, y'all, she is an unrecognized person. Nobody would know, uh, nobody would care that she's staying there. But Megan insisted that she be registered using an alias. I can't let anybody know that I'm here because I'm so famous. I'm just going to be so put upon if anybody knows that I'm here. So, um, after the booking was confirmed, Megan announced that she could not stay at that hotel. Mm -mm. No, they, they aren't. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to be associated with this hotel because apparently the owner, the Sultan of Brunei had come out recently and said that adulterers and homosexuals should be punished according to Sharia law and that women who had abortion should be publicly flogged. Okay. Well, I don't think any of those things needs to happen, but Megan insists that she cannot stay at a hotel owned by somebody who would say things like this. So she insists that she get accommodations elsewhere. So Nelthorpe Crown has to scramble, finds another hotel that's willing to accommodate Megan. Um, and in return, Megan agrees to promote the hotel. Me Nelthorpe Crown is generous in this sentiment, but I can only imagine the tone with which she said it. She was protective of her image, said Nelthorpe Crown, and she didn't want to do anything that could compromise that. Yeah, well, I mean, nobody, it's just unbelievable that she would care that much about where she stays at this hotel when nobody in their right mind would be tracking Megan so carefully that they would fly into a rage when they found out that she was staying somewhere owned by the Sultan of Brunei. Like it just like, do you see what I'm saying? Like visions of grandeur that she, that she thinks that anyone would be tracking her movements to such an extent that they would know where she was staying and then try to make um, some kind of example out of her. I don't understand who she thinks that she is. All right. Well, nobody, we, no one knew who she was. We don't, we still don't know who she is. Megan is 100% an unknown name. And nobody wanted to work with her for this very reason. We don't know her. So poor Nelthorpe Crown is over there slogging, trying to find some kind of speaking engagement, some kind of client who will work with Megan. Nobody cares. She kept telling everybody, Nelthorpe Crown keeps telling everybody that Megan is a strong, entrepreneurial, fluent woman of substance. I'm sorry, by what, by whose estimation? A fluent woman of substance? Somebody name me one thing that Megan has done that would show that she's a woman of substance. I can't think of it. And neither could anybody else. And everybody always said, I mean, we don't want Megan. We don't know who she is. She's unknown. We don't even know this show suits. She doesn't have a profile. She, if she, if, if they don't know her in America, she's an American. If they don't even know her there, what do we want her here in England for? Nobody wanted her. And so um, she was constantly being shut out. She wasn't being hired for engagements. And Megan did not try to hide her frustration with poor Nelthorpe Crown. Megan took it out on her and was very angry and indignant that Nelthorpe Crown could not manage to secure her any new work. But then after consulting her agent and publicists, Megan spotted an opportunity. Hmm, how can I get people's attention? Oh, yes. I'll do the one thing that I can do that no one can dispute me about. I'll come out and say that I've been horribly maligned, mistreated and abused because of my biracial heritage. So she comes out swinging with the race card. Until this point, she had never mentioned race publicly, except for like two times. Once she had mentioned it at the third annual Witness uh, Uganda concert in Los Angeles. And then another time she'd been part of this anti-racism video for the U.S. charity, A Race to Hate. But other than that, it really hadn't been part of her persona. She didn't talk about it a lot, on her, a lot on her blogs. In fact, she didn't mention it at all. And even in Suze, as we've said, they didn't make much of the fact that she was biracial, except for the second season when her dad on the show shows up and he's black. So that kind of began like it was at this time when she started to realize I can get some traction if I talk about this because no one can tell me that this isn't my lived experience so I can say anything I want to and no one's going to say anything about it and it makes me gives me points in the whole victim oppressor culture that we are currently in so she's deciding that reconsidering her past she could sincerely present herself as a victim of racism and then by that means 
become more of a household name. And so she's got to rebrand herself because up until this point, she's never made a peep about it. She's never made anybody aware that she's, you know, been used and abused in this society. So she decides that through Elle magazine, she will come out as having experienced brutal racism at the hands of hateful Americans. She breezed into Elle's office and met Justine Harmon, one of the magazine editors. Megan, the entire time, is just so disgusting and annoying. She tells, you know, she's trying to ingratiate herself with this Justine Hartman. And at one point offers to write the place cards for Harmon's wedding. Okay, well, who wants her little handwritten place cards? Why would you even bring that up in this interview? So anyway, despite being super cringy about trying to get work for herself as a calligrapher, she successfully does pitch this idea to the magazine that what what she should do, and Elle should report on it, Elle should send her to the island of Malta, where she's going to research her mixed race roots. This is her claim. Okay, I'm going to read this to you. Somewhere in the distant past, she recalled Grandmother Markle mentioned that her father's great-great-great Irish grandmother, Mary Bird, lived in Malta with an English soldier called Thomas Bird. They married and a child was born in Malta in 1862. To give the story greater attraction, Mary Bird was said to have been employed as a cook in 1856 at Windsor Castle. <laughs> what? What? What is this wild fantasy? I mean, this is, I mean, talk about some fantasies off the tig. Remember last chapter where we said that was like her big thing? She just write these like fantasy pieces. Well, apparently she's embroidering the past as well. Well, Elle Magazine doesn't even, they don't even skip a beat. They're like, yeah, we'll send you to Malta. So they get this grand plan. They contact the Maltese Tourist Authority and they say, look, if you could give Megan a free trip to Malta, we will write a whole article that's basically an advertisement for Malta. We will talk about your restaurants, your local food, the wine, the beaches, and we'll use the island as the backdrop for a gorgeous fashion shoot. So... The Maltese Tourist Authority is like, sure, we'll fund that. <laughs> They're going to heavily regret it. Megan says that this trip was mostly about trying to understand where I came from, my identity. And there's something so lovely about fitting in a piece of the puzzle. And that's what I went to do. Everyone told me that when you go to Malta, everyone's gonna look like you. Oh my gosh. I did sort of blend in there and it was the loveliest feeling. <laughs> well, Megan, you've blended in your whole life. That's why no one realized that you were biracial. When exactly were you standing out as different from anybody else in any kind of capacity? When, when were you people's token ethnic friend? The way you act like, you know, I was just so different from everybody and, and I was always sort of on the fringes of society and nobody wanted to bring me into the fold, you know, because I was just so different. First of all, what are you talking about? What age do you think you grew up in? Okay, but anyway, she says for the first time she blended in in Malta. Okay, but this is what's ridiculous. This is what she writes, that she went to discover her identity. But to Nelthorpe Crown's surprise, Nelthorpe Crown went with her to Malta. The moment they landed on the island, Megan decided against researching her white ancestry. Why would I want to do that? I don't need to highlight that because that's not why I've had so much suffering. It's because I'm half black. So not, not surprisingly, Megan had no ancestry in Malta. The 19th century soldier Thomas Byrd married Mary McHugh, or is it McHugh? Who could know at this point? And Donnybrook, Dublin in January, 1860 clearly excluding any employment in Windsor Castle. Bird was posted with his wife in India and went briefly to Malta, but soon after a son was born and they moved to Canada where Thomas died and Mary remarried and became Mary White. Thomas Marvel's always said that Megan's wild tale of, you know, the English soldier and the, and the young lady getting married in Malta and then hustling on over to go work at Windsor Castle was a great big fraud. 
but Megan per tried to persist in it. But of course, as soon as they land, she, you know, lets the whole idea go because she knew they weren't going to find anything in Malta. Can you imagine the fraud of this? She's getting a free trip to Malta because she lied. All right, well, now Lord Crown's like, huh, did Megan really intend to look for her answer ancestors? No, she did not. And Nelthorp Crown says, and this is very interesting, everything she does is carefully curated and forensically planned. The sensitive soul searching for her roots was replaced by what Nelthorp Crown identified as the businesswoman's first and foremost. Money, Nelthorp Crown concluded, was Megan's priority. Those are really cutting words from somebody who admits that she and Megan were like besties at one point. Nelthorpe Crown says she really fell under Megan's spell and thought that she was warm and inviting and lovely and thought Megan was great. But on the other side of this, she sees things much more clearly. Megan was curated and forensically planning everything that she did and money was the objective in all things. Now, during these days, Megan spoke to Gina about branding herself as a foodie, as a beauty and fashion expert, as an advocate for wellness. That's all she talked about. Like, it was all the TIG talk is what it was. The entire time they were in Malta, they never discussed race. They didn't even bring it up. It wasn't like that had been the initial reason for the trip was to rebrand herself as this person searching an identity, trying to understand her mixed race past. Yet she never spoke about it. She never spoke about politics. She never spoke about her father. She never spoke about Serena Williams. She never spoke about any celebrities that she claimed to be friends with on her website. All of the false things that she could not prove to Gina Nelthorpe Crown, she made sure not to mention because Gina might ask questions about it. So she stuck with, I'm a foodie and I'm a beauty and, and fashion expert and all this. Megan's whole goal on that trip was to make sure that Gina was firmly in her corner and that Gina would never ask any questions. And Gina says, I fell under the spell of Megan. Everyone did. She says, not only did she exude warmth and sincerity, but she made you feel that you were the only person in the world that mattered. She's a girl's girl and we shared many stories. So they had become very close on this trip, even though there was a lot of questions in Gina's mind about why exactly they were there. Um, and it gets more shocking Unfortunately for the Maltese Tourist Authority, Megan's published article in Elle made no mention of Malta. The islands, restaurants, wines, beaches, they were all forgotten, and the photographs that were shot on the island weren't even used. So they had just funded this free trip for Megan and her friend and got nothing out of it. And of course they couldn't because Megan didn't spend any time trying to research where her family came from. It was just to hang out. Now, Tom Bauer says that the article that Elle did run for the magazine was well-written and it was titled Meghan Markle, I am more than an other. And in this article, again, not talking about Malta in any way, she introduced the idea that she had lived a very difficult life, um, having to struggle with the dichotomy of being mixed race in response to Elle. And she says, in response to Elle's invitation to share my story, I struggled to decide if I wanted to do that. Okay, you guys, Elle did not invite her to share her story. She marched into the office and said, I got an idea for you guys. I got a story for you guys. What if we talk about my mixed race past? And I just find this to be ridiculous because she goes on to talk about how when they invited me to talk about it, I was, I'll be honest, scared. Today, I'm choosing to be braver, to go a bit deeper, to share a much bigger picture of that with you. Why are you scared to talk about your past? Are you ashamed of the fact that your mother is black and your dad is white? Why would that even be a thing that you have to be, I had to get brave. I had to talk myself into it. I was scared when else came and spoke to me and wanted to dig into my past. And I wasn't sure if I was ready to do that. But then after careful thinking, I came to the conclusion that yes, I can be brave. I'm confused about why bravery is needed to talk about your black mother. Are you ashamed of her? I'm confused by why you can't talk about your white father. Are you ashamed of him? What does your race have to do with shame? I don't understand this. 
Why, why do you have to get brave? Why are you scared? Why are you acting like I'm revealing a very tender and intimate part of myself? I'm choosing to reveal to you that I am biracial. Nobody cares. It's like literally the least important thing about you. Okay, so anyway, she goes on to retell her three famous stories. My dad got me Barbie dolls that were two different colors. One time I had to check a box. I wasn't sure how I felt. Another time somebody at college said something disparaging about my mixed race family. She says this world of not fitting in and of harboring my emotions so tightly under my ethnically nondescript and not so thick skin was difficult for me. I lived in a murky area, a haze around how people connected with me. While my mixed heritage may have created a gray area surrounding my self-identification, keeping on both sides of the fence, I have come to embrace that, to voice my pride in being a strong, confident, mixed race woman. Nobody, nobody cares. Literally nobody cares that you're mixed race. I, I cannot stress this enough. Nobody cares. It's not interesting. It doesn't matter. It makes you neither wonderful nor horrible. It's just a thing about you. It's not even worth talking about. I can't believe you'd write a whole article about the color of somebody's skin. Okay, so now that Megan has come out as biracial, Elle, and, and Elle has written this article about her, Nelthorpe Crown thinks, okay, now that she's been in a magazine and had you know, a feature, a feature story about her, maybe I can get people to actually be interested in her because before they said she had no profile, maybe they'll want to get in with her now. So Nelthorpe Crown used the article as leverage to invite 30 potential buyers of Megan, the brand, to Home House, which is a private members club in central London. They invite her to come. And at this event, she appeared in a, discuss in a discussion with the Sudanese child soldier and musician. And it, during the discussion, they talked about feminism and women's empowerment. Pertinently, the topic of race never came up. That was the whole reason that she was in L because she's been so maligned and mistreated because of her racial heritage. And that is her new brand. But of course, in this environment, she figured people didn't want to hear about that. So this is when she's going to focus on feminism and empowerment um, because she's got to play her cards where she thinks that they will be best accepted. But the result of this whole discussion and the result of meeting these 30 potential buyers was really disappointing because the audience dismissed her as uninteresting. What do we care? You know, you're saying the same platitudes about feminism and women's empowerment that everybody says. Everyone says the same things. So what are you bringing to the table? Why do we need to care about what your opinion is? L'Oreal and all the other cosmetic firms rejected the invitation to feature Megan as the face of their brand. They could care less. And the only glimmer of hope was an offer of a possible contract with a lesser known Swiss watchmaker. And that's all she got out of that. 30 people, 30 buyers were there and, and all 30 people except for one passed. Hard pass, Megan, no thank you. So depending on how you looked at it, Megan was either hitting a real roadblock in her career or she was at kind of a crossroads. Like what was she gonna be? Was she gonna keep trying to be an actress or was she gonna try to be a lifestyle brand or was she gonna try to be an advocate for women's empowerment and racial equality? Like what exactly was Megan's deal in the world? Um, so it would seem that Megan was deciding that she was going to really investigate where she could get with John Fitzpatrick's connections to politics. Now, as I alluded to at the beginning of this episode, remember how I said that Fitzpatrick is some kind of question mark when it comes to how Megan was getting leg up after leg up in the world because Megan doesn't have a lot of personality that you would necessarily want. She doesn't have a lot of skills. She doesn't have a lot of talent. She's not this, um, she's not like a, she, she doesn't have like the supermodel body. Like her, her dreams and goals and aspirations of becoming this fashion, this fashionista, it's not really happening. Like how does she keep failing up? Well, because she knows people like John Fitzpatrick and Fitzpatrick um, at this time when she's kind of floundering, her career is just fizzling in various er arenas. He takes her by the arm and says, follow me, dear. I'll show you the path. And he 
invites her to the St. Patrick's Day reception on the 17th March of 2015 at the White House. Now, the previous night, he had hosted this big dinner with 200 Irish American celebrities. And Meghan had been with him during all of this. And it's interesting because he describes their relationship as follows. Now, remember, when he met her, she was still dating Corey. He describes his relationship with Meghan like this. She was dating a celebrity chef, which was on and off. And she was kind of seeing someone. Then he goes on, officially, I was not dating her. We were just best friends. Okay, if you're really just best friends with somebody, you don't need to say, officially, I was not dating her. You would just say, I'm not dating her. What is this officially business? Officially. Yeah, because nobody, she doesn't want anybody to know that she's sleeping around with you in order to gain favors. You're like, at this point, like 20 years older than her. Okay, so anyway, Fitzpatrick invites her to the White House. She goes. And she's elated to be amongst the political elite. She even gets to meet Barack Obama. And it is a night to remember. She feels like her future is being invigorated by this relationship that she has with Fitzpatrick because he is bringing her in with like the top, top people. And so she feels like, you know, it's just, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's only up from here. I can truly begin to scale the ladder and find myself sitting right next to the, you know, the greatest among us. Fitzpatrick, by the way, thinks Megan is the best. Like he loves her. He thinks she is so much fun. And he talks about how Megan just knew how to jump right in and roll with the punches about how one time he had brought Megan um, over to his house um, and he invited a couple people over and then like 30 people showed up and Megan got right behind the bar and helped him serve drinks. And he was astounded that she, you know, would be so servant hearted. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Megan's favorite place would be behind the bar because of all the attention. People need a drink, they have to come talk to her. You know, of course she'd love it. Okay, anyway, back onto her political aspirations. She believed that she was on an upwards trajectory and that it was going to just be win, win, win after this. Not only was she meeting Democrat Party's aristocracy, but with Hillary Clinton's support, Elizabeth Nelmiaro, remember the woman that she'd worked with previously and had gone to Rwanda with, had agreed that Megan would be allowed to address the UN Women's Conference in New York. Okay, there was two events going on. At the first conference, that was all the VIPs. The previous year, Emma Watson had addressed that group. And that's when Megan had seen Emma Watson and felt like, that needs to be me. It cannot be little Hermione Granger. It has to be me. And so she had been all excited, hoping that she, she could secure that conference. At the same time, there was a second meeting for children and minor personalities, and that was held on the 10th of March and is sort of a off-Broadway theater. All right, well, Megan's name was not featured in this press release for the program's publicity. Megan was not, she was part of the, of the event, but it is very important to note, she was not part of the VIP event. She was going to be speaking very briefly at the event for children at an off-Broadway theater, okay? Now, as she was going, would go on to retell of this, she would make it sound like she and Emma Watson had been standing side by st side on stage at the UN Women's Conference. She would go on to style this whole story as though she had been as important as any A-list celebrity at that event, and that she, uh, but for her, feminism would have stopped dead in its tracks. But thankfully, under her careful tutelage, she was able to continue to hold the torch for feminism. And but for her, it would have all been over for women all over the globe. Okay, so anyway, Megan invited her mother to the event and told her mom that this was the most important event of her life. She planned to emulate Emma Watson. And in her brief address, Megan fluently recited the story of her childhood protest to Procter & Gamble. And she said at this speech that she gave again in the off-Broadway theater to the children that she had received a reply 
from Hillary Clinton herself when she stood up against Procter & Gamble and how she had single-handedly changed the Procter & Gamble campaign. And she said, it was at that moment that I realized the magnitude of my actions. At the age of 11, I had created my small level of impact by standing up for equality. Oh my gosh, it's so lame. And against all odds, people believed her. They thought she was telling the truth, probably because who in their right mind would get up and tell such a colossal lie? So anyway, then she goes on to talk about her work in Rwanda. What work in Rwanda? You mean when you dipped into the refugee camp, looked around, asked a couple of questions, didn't care what the answers were, and then hightailed it back to your luxury hotel? Would that work? Referring to her visit to Rwanda, she said, I've always wanted to be a woman who works, and this type of work is what feeds my soul and fuels my purpose. You mean using other people for the background of your photos? Is that what fuels your purpose? Again, she praised President Kangami and said that we need more men like that. And then she re finished it by repeating Emma Watson's feminist sentiments. So basically just a bunch of plagiarism. She said, I'm so proud to be a woman and a feminist. And this evening, I'm extremely proud to stand before you on this significant day, which serves as a reminder to all of us how far we've come, but also a mid-celebration, a reminder of the road ahead. This is just boring. This is boring talk. This, what is this? What are these platitudes? This means nothing. Well, that audience loved the shallowness of the sentiments. They applauded her enthusiastically. But as I stated before, over the following years, many got the impression she'd spoken to the United Nations General Assembly in the auditorium alongside Emma Watson. Few realized that Watson didn't speak at the UN that year and that Meghan had addressed a sideshow audience. Now, this is where it all begins to fall apart for Meghan at the UN. Soon afterwards, Meghan urged Elizabeth Nyamiyaro to introduce her to Emma Watson. Nyamiyaro refused. Never deterred, Meghan asked Nyamiyaro to promote her to UN ambassador. Kumzili Milambo Nyakuka, the South of African director of UN Women, was doubtful. Meghan's cause could not have been helped by giving the impression to some people that while she did speak about politics, philosophy, and ideology, her apparent all-consuming passion for the empowerment of women was in reality focused on self-promotion and the empowerment of Meghan Markle. Whatever the reason, Nyama Yaro refused Meghan's request to be promoted to ambassador. Meghan resigned from he for she and cut her ties with UN women. Yet remarkably, Despite the unpublicized split, she continued to cite publicly her UN women experience as proof of her philanthropy. Outsiders never glimpsed the truth about the rupture or the reasons. So Maggie just felt that she'd been underestimated the whole time. That those jokers at the UN Women's Conference, what did they even know about feminism? What did they even know about philanthropy? What did they even know about anything? And she didn't need them to make her way in the world. She had her own thing going. By the way, the TIG was attracting nearly 1 million followers on Instagram. And she had over 250,000 followers on Twitter. So what does she need the UN for? She had passed a milestone of a thousand posts on her blog. And so she really didn't need anybody giving her some kind of a hand out. She'd make her own way. And if those jokers couldn't understand what she was about, then that was their mistake. And that was their fault. And they'd see what she could do. The thing is, as an influencer, she really was living the life she wanted to live. I mean, what did she really want to do with the UN women? She didn't really want to go hang out in Africa with all those poor kids. As an influencer, she got all kinds of freebies. She had clothes on loan. Um, there was all kinds of product promotions that she was getting paid for. And she had secured some uh, deals with Bobby Brown makeup, Lavin Fashion, um, Reitman's, which was a mid-market fashion retailer in Toronto. She had a photographer that she worked for with on the TIG who was always taking these beautiful photos of her. She was constantly promoting herself on her own website. She didn't need a handout from the UN. And those stodgy women had no idea what it was to be a real woman anyway. A real woman lays in the bed with your dogs and talks, calls them nuggets and, and her tag team. A real woman is all about promoting different kinds of supplements one specific called moon dust, which is a blend of herbs and plant extracts and minerals um, to invigorate and enhance your beauty and your brain and your body and your sexual energy and your sleep and your spirit. That's what a real woman does. A real woman spends time talking on her website all about ashwagandha, which is a root that aids the thyroid 
and also give sexual satisfaction if you care about that kind of thing. The thing is, is that Megan just wasn't ever going to be a fit for the UN women. And she was only willing to use them because she was looking for a way to promote herself. But when she realized that this was a group of women that probably weren't gonna be taken in by all of her simple talk and all of her shallow reasonings for being a feminist, she honestly didn't know how to fit into that group. So she tried to shake the dust of the UN off her feet like it was her plan to leave. They didn't want her and she didn't know how to fit in. So she definitely knows how to fit into this Instagram culture and she was doing well for herself. Uh, promoting herself as this hippy dippy California girl. Megan loved to describe herself on the TIG as opinionated and driven with a deep desire to affect change. But change for what? What change are you trying to affect? Like, I don't understand what Megan, like, how does Megan does a lot of talking without giving any examples? How exactly have you done all the things that you claim to be doing? To, I think the thing that offends me the most about Megan is how often she insults the intelligence of her audience. She doesn't care. She just needs those clicks. She had firmly settled into, I guess, you know, I'm an influencer. Like she decided that, because remember her career was kind of at a crossroads. Which, which way is she going to take? It seemed for a minute like she might be getting political and it seemed for a minute like she might be getting some in with the UN, but she didn't fit in there. So She's all in on the on the influencer identity at this specific point in her life. She writes on the tag that she liked to keep fit. She ran six miles a day. She did hot yoga, platinum Pilates. She liked acupuncture and cupping. She started the day with a cup of hot water and a slice of lemon, some steel cut oats mixed with almonds, bananas, agave syrup, soy milk. Then she'd grab a smoothie. I mean, just so blase. Nothing is being said, nobody cares. I'm just gonna be so over it. But she had all of the typical political um, opinions, you know, the, the, the kind of opinions where you don't really have to dig too deeply into what you're saying. You just have to say it and then everyone will glob on and be like, yeah, me too. Like, I hate Donald Trump, or I'm opposed to Brexit, or I believe in self-empowerment. I'm a global citizen of the world. Like just these little, you know, generally accepted statements that aren't going to rock the boat. Um, you get to get people agreeing with you without ever having to think much about what it is you're saying. Um, and most of the time her website just wasn't very interesting as far as proving that she really had all these celebrity friendships that she claimed to have. She had a couple of people that she was able to rely on to mention. She frequently mentioned Serena Williams. She said, you know, she was proud friends with Millie McIntosh, um, who was a Made in Chelsea star. You know, she kept wanting to tell us all about Roy McElroy. And, you know, letting us know he was, you know, the real deal. And how many times is she going to tell us about him loving his veal ragu? As someone stated in the comments, why is she such a proponent, proponent of his veal ragu when she tries to tell us that she's a vegan? She's okay with veal, though. And, you know, she just went on to talk about all of these people that she knew, but like, she's just, you know, regurgitating the same celebrity names because she's only got a few people she can actually say she knows. She did a lot of name checking though. Like she would just talk about other celebrities. Careful not to say she had a relationship with them, but just like she was in such close proximity with them. She could use their, their nicknames. Like she would refer to Elizabeth Hurley as Liz, you know, just, you don't know Elizabeth Hurley. You've never even sat and, you know, had a drink with her, but, you know, she'd talk about Heidi Klum and, and all these people, like she really knew them. And she's the kind of chick you, you, you know, you'd love to have a drink with. Well, how do you know? You don't even know her. How do you know she's the kind of chick you'd like to have a drink with? Interestingly though, she never mentioned the celebrities and the people that she actually knew who were actually giving her a leg up in society. She never mentioned John Fitzpatrick. She never met, mentioned the Clintons. She never mentioned the American Irish set that was setting her up over and over and over again. She kept the relationship secret that she thought it would, she could lose that were the ones that were actually helping her. And she knew that, that 
all of those people that she was really friends with in the background and all those people that she actually had connections and ties to would not appreciate her coming around and gushing and talking about them on her blog. So she knew when to keep quiet about what relationship she had. And of course, she'd been keeping her own celebrity chef boyfriend quiet for the entire time they'd been dating. Nobody on the TIG had any idea she was with Corey. But it was imperative for her to keep her star rising, for her to meet more celebrities. And the problem was that she, at this time, she was still living in Toronto. At the end of last chapter, we talked about how she was considering maybe moving to New York or, or spending more time in New York because Toronto, she had just wrung everything out of Toronto that she could. There just wasn't a lot of celebrities that she could meet there. And Corey's restaurant had only taken her so far. Yeah, celebrities like to come meet at his restaurant, but I mean, only so many of them. And the problem was that Hollywood, she hadn't been able to have a breakthrough. Toronto, she'd had what felt like a minor breakthrough, but then nobody would acknowledge the breakthrough that she had had. Nobody saw it as important as she did. And nobody seemed to be able to help her jettison to new heights. Fame was so elusive and she was desperate for it. And that's where the chapter ends. Next chapter is called Watershed. So we'll see what that is all about. What is this watershed moment that she seems to have? Um, it's a short chapter, so we're going to, I'll, I'll end up doing that, the next chapter, which is called Watershed, with a chapter called Rwanda, where we're gonna go more and more deeply into her relationship with Fitzpatrick and what she was doing and what she was, what she was embarking on to keep the Megan brand going. Okay. As promised before, I said that at the end of the episode, I would talk about the next book that I'm going to be reading. The next book I'm reading is not about the royal family. Now, don't be upset because, you know, I hadn't initially thought to do a channel about the royal family. I truly chose the book about Harry. One, because I didn't know a lot about Prince Harry and two, because it happened to be the memoir of the moment. So I was like, I want to talk about memoirs. Let's do this one. Um, and so I have loved talking about the royal family, but I don't want this channel to become only that because at a certain point you've said all you can say. Also, most people in the comments know more about the royal family than I do. So you guys must be, I mean, you guys must be tapped out when it comes to royal family talk because you know all of it already. You know probably more than any YouTube creator could possibly know. And so I think I would love to go back to the original plan for the channel, not saying that we'll never talk about royal family stuff again. Um, as it comes up, we'll definitely keep talking about it because it's interesting, but I have another book. It is called Stories I Tell Myself. Stories I Tell Myself was written by Juan F. Thompson, who was the son of Hen Hunter S. Thompson. Now, I'm sure that you all know who Hunter S. Thompson was. He was a very provocative journalist. And just listen to the back of this book. Patron saint of gonzo journalism, wild man, hellraiser, iconoclast, fearless truth teller, addict. The legendary Hunter S. Thompson was all of the above, but behind his mythic persona lies another story, that of a demanding husband and father with a hair trigger temper whose scathing wit cut as deeply at home as it did on the page. In this intimate, surprising memoir, Juan F. Thompson, Hunter's only son, tells of an at once singular and deeply familiar coming of age. Juan slept through Hell's Angels parties and rode on the back of Hunter's motorcycle as a small boy. He spent days sailing with Jimmy Buffett while his parents' marriage fell apart. But like so many other sons, he wrestled with his father's fits of rage and competed against countless other people and numerous distractions for his father's attention. Out of the ashes of a tenuous relationship, Juan writes of reconciliation with his aging father and watching Hunter evolve into a doting grandfather. Stories I tell myself and is an astonishing tale of a son who never gave up on his father and an unprecedented look into the life of the indelible Hunter S. Thompson. So I thought that was really interesting. I'll tell you that my sister, I have a twin sister, um, and she's the one about a year ago who told me about this book and I've been meaning to read it and I haven't had a chance to read it so I thought I would read it with you. So. We have a lot of revenge to get through. So we're gonna be on that for a while. But if you are wanting to read along with me on uh, some of these books that we do, I wanted to go ahead and tell you that this is the next book that we're gonna do. And I'll keep reminding you all of that so that it doesn't come as a surprise when we transition. But this is a, re I, I mean, it's an unbelievably interesting book. It is shocking. It is heartbreaking. It is 
incredibly interesting and I think it'll be a nice change and I think that you guys trust me at this point to tell you stories that are interesting so I'm looking forward to that um, this has been a really long episode thank you for hanging in there and we will uh, do two chapters next episode just to kind of keep things moving anyway it was great uh, seeing you I will see you again next week I hope you had a wonderful weekend bye